Join us for this next video in the series as we explore molten salt bath annealing. This is the Pounder Bath Project. In this second of our videos, we go deeper into information about using molten salt baths for annealing. Today's topics are an overview of the three key methods for annealing brass cartridge cases, briefly look at the individual vendor offerings in each of these categories, cover foundational materials on molten salts, their industrial uses and safety, wrap up with discussing background information on Pounder Bath and set up for the lab demo. We find there's three approaches to annealing cartridge cases. Let's look at each of these individually. Gas flames have been used for annealing brass for quite some time. During the manufacturing of brass cartridge cases, this is very often done with gas-fired ovens when the entire sample is being annealed. Later, after the cases have been formed, and what we use for reloading are flames from propane, butane, and MAP torches. This is because we need a focus flame as we're only annealing from the neck down through the shoulder and top part of the body. With the gas torch, we heat from the outside and the case may or may not be rotated while being heated. Factors like the number of torches, one or two, how they are positioned facing toward the case, and the effect of rotation speed are important. And in combination with the amount of time the flame stays in contact, dwell time, controls the thermal gradient down the brass case. This determines the degree and quality of annealing. Induction uses high frequency alternating current to excite the brass case, creating eddy currents, uh, which internally heat the brass, thus annealing it. There are a variety of induction coils used for heating brass cases, but unlike fly, flame, there isn't a single point of contact and the entire circumference of the case is heated at the same time. Thus, there's no need to rotate uh, the case if the induction coil has been designed correctly. Induction power plies are capable of creating high power densities, so the profile of applying this power in combination with dwell time controls the thermal gradient in the case and therefore the degree of quality of annealing. The final option is using pot furnaces to dip the brass cases in. The first of these is using molten lead. At first blush, this might seem like a good idea because many reloaders are familiar with processing lead alloy wheel weights and casting bullets. But we reject moving forward on this for several reasons. The densities and surface tension of the liquid lead alloys are high, and these are the very alloys used for soldering brass. So in combination with the fact that handling and vapor of leads are, topic, are toxic, we can understand why this type of bath hasn't been adopted. We too reject it out of hand for no, for no other reason than unwarranted safety risks. This leaves us with molten ionic salts. Because of the low surface tension of the solution and dipping into, an, dipping into the bath, this approach has the merit of effectively heating both from the inside and outside at the same time. Thus, with, thus, like with induction, there's no reason for rotation. Also, the entire circumference of the case is heated at the same time. The temperature of the bath, in combination with the immersion rate and dwell time, create a processing profile controlling the degree and quality of annealing. As we show the next few slides, please keep in mind we're not endorsing any of these individual offerings from the various suppliers. Indeed, we can say this isn't even a comprehensive survey of what's available in the market. Rather, rather some representative samples for uh, illustration purposes. Also, some of the suppliers are fairly small and may change business focus or leave the business altogether. So please follow up with the individual vendors for any specific questions and product availability. There are probably at least three ways of annealing with a torch. They can be a single stage, like the anneal right 2, shown here in photo 2. Here the case is static in a retainer, heated by one or two torches, and the knob is twisted uh, to drop out the case. 
Photo 3 is a deal to a kneel where the retainer is like a socket and is used on a hex drive and rotated in the flame with a drill. We believe that at one time Hornaday offered a kit such as this approach. There are what we call drop and roll types, where cases are fed from a hopper that feeds into a set of rollers in the flame. Photo 4 is the annealese. Photo 5 shows the Girard offering of the drop and roller type. Photo 6 is the bench source annealer, which is a turntable type, where the cases are heated by either one or two torches. Case rotate in and then are spun in the flame and out the other side. Then the case drops off the bottom of the turntable. And here in figure one is another turntable type called Sassy Brass. There are many do-it-yourself projects for single and drop and roll type annealers. So depending on the type and complexity, costs can run from very low to moderate. When purchasing a turnkey system, either the drop and roll or turntables, they are all moderately priced. Induction type annealers are more complex because of the electronics and power circuits involved, but on a whole are simple to operate. Unlike torches, which are lit during the whole annealing session, induction units only come on when cases are inserted and usually for very short periods of time. Example is two to six seconds is all it takes. All of the units we're able to find are single insert and drop in designs. Several models offer case feeders for batch processing type automation. Because of the technology and fabrication involved, there are fairly limited do-it-yourself projects. And these are also the reasons these annealers cost from the medium to the high end. In industry, we think you'll find induction type manufacturing processes uh, used for final case annealing and stress relieving, whereas it's more common seeing flame used in large batch or continuous flow furnaces for annealing cups and draws. Figure 8 is the ANI unit from uh, Fluxion showing one type of annealing coil. They offer several different types. Photo 9 is the Girard drop and roll type annealer adapt for use with the Fluxion unit. Figure 11 is the Easy Anneal, single drop-in type annealer. And Figure 10 is the Annealing Made Perfect unit. We also show their add-on unit for automatic case handling permitting batch type automation. Now let's look at pot or dip bath annealing. This approach uses simple pot furnaces and cases are just dipped into the heated solution. And for the reasons discussed earlier, the focus here is just on ionic salt baths. Just looking at the approach operationally and the simplicity of design, you can see how this is attractive and a needler can be built for very low cost. That said, we found only one provider, Ballistic Recreations from Canada offers the items illustrated in Figure 12. A jar of annealing salts, a single channel thermocouple thermometer, a K-type thermocouple, similar to those used in the exhaust gas probes, a two-hole case holding jig, and instructions for use. To complete the annealer, you separately purchase the Lee Precision Melter Pot Furnace. It comes as a surprise to us to see such limited offerings. We wondered why this is. Is it that reloaders don't know about bath annealing? Don't fully understand the process? Are there dangerous conditions creating unsafe situations? Does pot annealing even work or work well enough? What we saw was a new, maybe unproven approach with begs for research and development. Our Pounder Bath project is about this investigation. So exactly what are molten salts? They're just simple inorganic compounds, 
sodium, potassium, calcium, nitrogen, chlorine, and oxygen, and some of the high temperature blends include barium and silica. Their ionic salts, describing their type of bonding versus the covalent bonds holding organic molecules together, an example is common table salt, sodium chloride. In fact, sodium chloride is used one of the, is used one of the salts uh, for the salt baths. All of these are white crystalline solids at room temperature. They're also hydroscopic, so they absorb water. When heated, they melt to give clear to yellowish liquids. In this state, they're referred to as molten, which is a little bit unfortunate because it conjures up notions of molten lava or molten steel. And that's really not the case at all. These solutions are actually very low viscosity on par with water. And then when cooled, they return to the solid state and can be used over and over. The salts used for uh, molten salt baths are organized by uh, operating range. On the low end are class one, which operate from about 160 to about 600 degrees C. On the high end, class eight, they operate from about 900 to 1300 degrees C. Molten salt baths have been used for many decades. The bath types are various. We're concerned with cartridge case annealing and stress relieving. The molten salt baths are also used for bluing, tempering, quenching, steels, heat treating aluminum, high temperature drawn stainless steel annealing, and high temperature steel hardening. It's also used in chemical cleaning. There's a new application using the uh, molten salts for heat transfer fluids. The molten salts are piped through the collector and solar farms and then down into boilers and such for um, that industry. There's a broad range of suppliers, design engineers, and manufacturers in the molten salt bath industry. And what about safety? Salt baths are just like many other industrial heating processes, steel and other metal alloy manufacturing, solder, brazing, welding, and then uh, all the different types of heat treating and case hardening. Think about it on par with bullet casting methods. Molten lead goes over at about 700 degrees, and that's toxic. Class one and class two molten salt baths operate at about 600 degrees C. We think the main risks are damaging spills and burns. So think about process safety. Here you've got water-like viscosity. The solution needs special care. You want to control the temperature of the bath. You don't want to boil these solutions. And then like with many other heated processes, uh, getting near water and uh, getting in contact with organic material is not good. Fortunately, there's uh, a lot of different uh, industry application notes and white paper that talk about salt baths and procedural safeties. If you think you're interested in doing molten salt baths, uh, we'd recommend some background and wet processing, say things like ultrasonic or bullet coating. If you've had some experience with uh, casting bullets or uh, the other heat treating processes, soldering, brazing, it's good to have that kind of background before you get into this. But if you do, you should organize and respect safety. That's very important. You need to plan ahead for handling very hot items. Uh, we secure the bath to the tabletop. We've seen many videos where a torch is uh, propped precariously on a small stand. And we also see videos of people with their salt bath just uh, sitting freely on, a, on the workbench. And uh, getting spills from that can be very dangerous. So we recommend uh, safety shields for the face, uh, protective coats, thermal gloves, and where appropriate, having thermal blankets. Safety first is uh, critical for being successful here. We envision our pounder bath project more as a research tool and proof of concept than building a production annealer. It's here to support uh, projects in, in shooting and reloading. The, uh, it's a low cost solution. All the parts of the prototype are under $250. It met our flexibility requirements. Uh, we can do 223 Remington, 300 Blackout, and then the larger 6.5 Creedmoor and 308 Winchester cases easily. We like the idea of a simple tabletop pot 
and then we designed this for ease of use and uh, minimizing drag out. The main components are the uh, Lyman Big Dipper. This is a little larger than the Lee unit. This goes up to five pounds and handles 850 watts. Uh, so that's a little bit bigger than what's used on the other system. Uh, we developed our own in-house blend of class one salts. There's a commercial suppliers that we could have gone with, but they want to ship this stuff in 55 gallon drums and we didn't need it for our projects. Uh, we in-house build a PID furnace controller. Uh, we'll be demoing that for you and then purchase the digital thermometers and various K-type thermal couples. And then we fabricated pot covers, a uh, case cal carousels and the uh, cuspidor. To get the most out of the molten salt bath and operate it safely, we follow these startup and shutdown protocols. There's definitely more involved here than either flame or induction annealing, but nothing unusual. So even though our pot is small compared to other industrial processes, you can't cheat physics, and it's advised you follow the appropriate safety rules and protocols. For example, you just can't turn full power onto the pot and allow the PID control to drive things before you reach a process steady state. It would be similar to barely starting out in the car and switching on cruise control. Things have to be done in stages. Step one, preheat, is done by setting just a single temperature. Our goal is to flash off condensation and drive out air pockets. We're using the pot controller, but the PID controller is just turned on. We're showing uh, you use the solid cover, which you can see on the bottom left, with a target temperature of around 120 degrees C. The second step, we just call it ice cube, which is done with the set point. And there our goal is to get the solution uh, completely liquid, get out all remaining solids. We're doing this again with the pot controller. The PID controller's on, the solid lid stays on, and we're targeting about 250 degrees C. Step three, ramp up. The goal here is to come up to the operational temperature. We're still using the pot controller. Now we change over to the temperature measure uh, cover, which you see here in the middle, and we uh, nudge up the pot controller to 250 to about 500 degrees C. Step four, we now have reached operational steady state. We're at our operating temperature. The pot controller is just turned on and the PID controller takes over. We take off the measuring cover and we're now using the carousels and operating at 500 degrees. Shutdown, if done either normally or as an emergency, the goal is just to let the solution come down to room temperature and solidify. All we have to do is turn off the pot and PID controllers, put back on the solid cover, and let it come back down to temperature. We kind of think of this process as one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. Here's a still photo of the pounder bath setup. We'll go through this when we get to the demo video. In the meantime, let's enjoy this jingle that Jeffrey put together for us. Anneal anneal is good for your brass. The more you anneal, the more you shoot. The more you shoot, the better you feel. So let's anneal every deal. This completes our presentation. As you're thinking about subscribing, please take a moment and look over these important notes and disclaimers. They're here for both your protection and ours. Join us for our next video in this series. Thanks for watching. See you soon.